familiar with me but every breath you take every step you make I'm there with you in the light of day or in the dark of the night I'm there you may have had little hints of my presence but still remained unaware of me maybe you noticed that dry throat or annoying dry cough Maybe you come down with the flu and wonder why it took you such a long time to shake it. Or maybe you have noticed your gardens or your weather seems a little odd. <laughs> See, the problem is, I'm more or less invisible. I'm not going to be like your normal introduction when you meet someone. I'm not going to tap you on the shoulder, ask you how you are. I'm just going to float around your neighbourhood and introduce myself quietly. You won't even notice me there. <laughs> but hey, while I have your attention, let me introduce you to The Dummy's Guide to Chemtrails. I have visited every person around the globe and most have no idea I dropped in. See, I travel by plane, but I'm not your normal traveller. Because I'm in a very light padded form, I don't use your normal passenger plane, or I don't even take up a seat. I sit in holding tanks, and when I reach my destination, my pilot simply flicks the switch and I disembark from the jet engine. And if you have just happened to look up, you will see me ever so slowly floating down to see you. I may be a little slow in reaching you, but please have patience. I do have a lot of sky to cover. <laughs> and not to forget the heat from the sun, which if you are looking up, you may find it extremely hard to see me as I cover the sky. I can block the sun, making it so hard you cannot even look up because of the glare I create. I may be small and next to invisible, as I am only nano-sized, but ever so slowly I will visit you. Hey, don't be fooled by my distant cousin Kong. Kong the Contrail. He won't hang around too long. He's not all that fond of heights. Mixed with the heat from the sun, he will just disappear and evaporate. See, con, con is made up of water vapour, you know. When you breathe on a cold morning, or the exhaust on your car on a cold morning gets that steamy look, a bit like boiling your jug. It's just like con, made up water droplets to form condensation. <laughs> Maybe some of you have been listening to the propaganda box, whoopsie, I mean to say mainstream media, where they will have you believe it is con. Gee, haven't they too been con? most sociable of characters, as he won't hang around for too long, but me, <laughs> I will hang around you, climb all through you for as long as you live, or until such time my pilot stops flicking the switch. See, I also like sticking around to see what damage I can do. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I'm not selfish. I like to meet every living, breathing species and slowly see the devastation I can create. Anyway, I need to float, but hey, 
Next time you are out and about, maybe taking a nice leisurely stroll, riding your bike or playing with the children. Or maybe watching your favourite sportsman chasing a ball or even just relaxing in your garden. Spare a thought for me, as I will climb all through your body, I will absorb the moisture, making not only you dry, but also making your crops struggle to grow. From one end, from one extreme to the next. See, I forgot to tell you, but I am also a fantastic accelerant. <laughs> I can put my talents to all sorts, causing many catastrophes and many forms of devastation. Devastation should be my middle name. <laughs> Anyway, folks, from awakening to sleeping, I will be there. I will leave you with Dame Whittington. He has spent a good 10 years trying to expose me and trying to waken the sleepy heads out there. The sleepy heads who still haven't realised Mother Nature has been raped. Join him and put a me to rest. With so much travel around the globe, I've become tired, and the guilt is catching up with me. Like a psychopathic killer, I need to be stopped. So many things are going on in the atmosphere, you know, chemical spraying, of course, the chemtrails. Dane Wigington, he owns a 1,600-acre wildlife preserve next to Lake Shasta in California and has investigated all levels of geoengineering. Dane, welcome. How are you? Good, George. Thanks for giving me the chance to uh, address this uh, issue in depth. Uh, thankfully, people are waking up to this issue, and it's getting more serious by the day. When, when we hear the word geoengineering, what does that mean, Dane? And most people have never even heard that term. And, and the term basically, George, means that uh, to try to engineer the climate on a global scale. And indeed, uh, that, that is going on. All available data indicates that without reasonable doubt. Do, do you think the pilots, those who are spraying, know what they're spraying? Yes and no. In the case of military pilots, we, we certainly believe they would know what they're involved with more so than any commercial pilots. And many ask, you know, are commercial carriers involved with this? But there's data online, for example, Project Cloverleaf, that indicate a program outline for non-profitable commercial routes to be kept in the air uh, for use in these programs. And indeed, commercial carriers have been identified from the ground leaving a particulate trail. Again, this is not a condensation trail, but a particulate trail. Um, and those carriers, you know, certainly appear to be involved, but we, we don't believe any commercial pilots or personnel would have any idea of what's going on with these planes. Based on the data we've found so far, uh, these systems would be automated and, and probably not involving uh, direct knowledge of commercial pilots. Now, the, the residue that comes from the traditional contrails, which is, of course, the vapor discharge coming off of a jet, normal, can they hurt you at all? In comparison with an intentional payload disbursement, George, a, a big difference, and, and this is a big argument with people, is it a contrail, is it, is it a chemtrail, and again, chemtrail being the layman's term for geoengineering, but people should consider things, for example, if, if, if you're in a very cold day, you're walking down the street, your breath is condensing uh, as you go, you don't look behind you and see a trail stretching out for the last mile and expanding and covering the, the horizon. And again, NOAA's original data for a naturally occurring, quote, condensation trail was 70 below and 70 percent humidity. They've since scrubbed that from the net, just like they do after a nuclear accident. They, they suddenly change the, quote, safe levels and up them by 10,000 percent. So, you know, the science is uh, completely flexible when it comes to governmental agencies. But the, these, these trails that we see that linger and cover the sky to such a degree, George, that now global dimming, another term people aren't familiar with probably, uh, is estimated right now to be 20%. That means 20% of the sun's direct rays are no longer reaching the surface of the planet. There's a hell of a lot of metal up there, oh and, and we know that for a fact from our testing. We're going to get into that, too. That's, that's a frightening statistic. When I left Los Angeles last week, I'm in St. Louis this week, I had not come across as many people as I did 
ever that just were sick. They had these respiratory coughs. They were sneezing. They were convinced they weren't sick, but they didn't know what it was. They said, gosh, we've never had allergies before. I'm not sure this is an allergy season. Is it possible, Dane, that some of the spraying contributes to things like that where so many people just are sneezy, wheezy, itchy eyes, and everything else, and it has the symptoms of an allergy? It must be connected. And there are things, George, here that are absolutely beyond debate. There's a mountain of metal raining down on us, period. Um, in the last 10 years, we've seen rain test samples escalate from seven parts per billion. This is in Shasta, Shasta Siskiyou County in Northern California. Seven parts per billion, which is already very high given the location, uh, up to 3,450 parts per billion. That's, a, that's nearly a 50,000% increase in aluminum in the rain. I mean, it's, it's absolutely staggering levels. So when you have this, this mountain of metal raining down on you, uh, and, and there are nanoparticulates based on the patent's description of them, which are the most destructive, the smaller the particle, the more destructive the respiratory system. Now let's connect another dot. Um, according to statistics from 2005 to 2010, respiratory mortality in the continental U.S. went from eighth on the list of mortality to third. Huge. Huge leap. And sinusitis going off the charts, uh, ADD, Alzheimer's, autism. I mean, as we see the metals go up that are directly related to these programs, based on all available data, we see all these ailments go right with it. And obviously, it falls into the water supply system, too, doesn't it? It does. And, you know, it'd be, uh, it would be very helpful if these agencies and people in agencies would, would start to speak out. I personally was called into uh, Northern California Environmental Waste for a closed-door meeting and, and shown test of the Sacramento River, the drinking water for Southern California, with massive spikes in aluminum. And I was asked not to release those tests, which I have not, but I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about the issue now. So this is the big elephant in the room. I've, I've had uh, meetings with fish and game biologists, California fish and game, that are beside themselves with this issue, but afraid to speak out because they have no First Amendment protection. We do have a few courageous uh, U.S. Forest Service biologists, one in particular that's retired recently, uh, done water testing for three and a half decades. And he has noted an aquatic insect life decline in the last 10 plus years, which he attributes to this, this metal from these programs of 90%. It's a virtual crash in aquatic insect life in Shasta Siskiyou County. So, you know, we're seeing similar results across the planet. So, I mean, uh, what goes up must come down, and there's no question it's coming down. We wake up in the morning, the skies are clear. By the afternoon, the place looks like a tic-tac-toe pattern. Is that what we're talking about? It is. And again, that's what got me onto this issue. I, I grew up in Southern California hacking on smog. All I could think about as a kid was getting the hell out of there. And when I finally made it to the Pacific Northwest and uh, in 2001, completing this home in the wilderness and then seeing these grid patterns above my home, again, my background being in solar, some days losing 60, 70, 80 percent of my solar PV uptake from whatever these aircraft were emitting and it quickly came to the subject of geoengineering, started testing um, and, you know, seeing that the elements named in the patents were exactly what was showing up on the ground. Um, and this is called solar obscuration, George. That's the goal of geoengineering, to block the sun. And uh, indeed, we have solid and indisputed scientific data stating Again, 20% of the sun's direct light is no longer reaching the surface of the planet. Some regions, it's even higher. So uh, virtually every single dot connects. And for those that choose to say this isn't happening, they're simply uh, putting their head somewhere where the, the sun doesn't shine. Uh, a after a decade of study, George, I didn't just choose this issue because it felt comfortable to me. This is the last battle I ever wanted to face. But after one examines this data to a certain degree, uh, the conclusion is reached that short of thermal nuclear catastrophe, there is no more immediate or more dire threat to all life on Earth than these programs. They're, they're thwarting the web of life from the atmosphere to the ground, uh, from microbes in the atmosphere, which they're just learning about, and their effect on climate, to soil microbes and, and everything in between. So uh, at a certain point, when you realize you can't walk out the door and breathe without sucking in a lung full of heavy metal, you know that you have no choice but to to try to stand and, and scream out. If they're modifying the weather day, why are they doing it? And why aren't they telling us? Well, I think they're not telling us for obvious reasons, uh, like they don't tell us about a hundred other things that we now know right. that have happened in the past with the military-industrial complex. Many layers to the onion as far as why they are doing this. From all available data, it looks like they started these programs 
as, as far back as the late 40s. It looked like, as always, such programs start for the desire for more control uh, and, and uh, power. And it, my conclusions are, as these programs evolved and were used strategically, more and more damage has begun to occur in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is horrifically damaged now, by the way, and this is not about Al Gore or carbon credits. It's about reality. So it appears, to fast forward to, to right now, they have triggered uh, things that cannot be stopped. They have triggered climate feedback loops, and, and not to say that there hasn't been other damage to the planet. Certainly human beings have uh, done plenty to harm the system overall. But that being said, the greatest single factor in climate disruption right now that is not, not being acknowledged by almost any scientific entity is geoengineering. And now it appears they've damaged the climate so horrifically, and they're trying desperately to, to spray more and manipulate more to try to cover up the damage they've already done. And that's a pretty vicious circle. With this weather modification, how do we know they're not trying to control the population? You know, the ability to reproduce in men has dramatically decreased. How do we know this isn't affecting that? Well, I think we do know that it is affecting uh, those aspects. And as far as that being part of an agenda, one can only conclude we've seen studies from the uh, Navy and Air Force on the effect of these nanoparticulates from, I believe, the late 90s. Rosalind Peterson, excellent researcher. I know you know her, and she's dug up a lot of this data. But So we know that they knew the harmful effects. It's That's common knowledge at this point, and they continue to spray anyway. So at minimum, one can only conclude that this, this massive uh, health implication for life on Earth is either an accepted consequence or perhaps worse yet, even a desired objective. But uh, we know now also that it's not just these metals, aluminum, barium, strontium, that we've identified, but there's a, a toxic synergism between these metals and other metals that we're exposed to, like mercury, mercury in the vaccines, mercury uh, you know, that we inhale from uh, the burning of hydrocarbon. And we were given studies that indicated if you combine aluminum with mercury under the right conditions, toxicity can increase up to 10,000%. So it's not just the lethalness of either metal independently. When they are combined, they become much more harmful. And with geoengineering, is it primarily the sprain and the weather modification, or does it include other things that they're doing? Well, it, it, on the weather modification, that involves many aspects as well. And, and we look back in the last few years, the NATO countries are certainly up to their eyeballs in this, and uh, it appears we have competing powers now as well, Russia and China, and that includes with the ionosphere heaters, the HARP installations. We, we think there might be as many as 18 around the globe right now. So on the strategic implications, in recent years we've seen countries, for example, like Pakistan, when they seem to be showing resistance to U.S. objectives, suddenly 20% uh, of their country is underwater. In Thailand, uh, a similar circumstance. The, the Thai government was reluctant to allow the U.S. to put a, quote, weather observation base there, which they probably realized was a weather modification base. Mm -hmm. And suddenly Thailand's uh, under record floods and underwater. And, and so these dots do seem to connect. You have the, the Haiti situation, you know, where the U.S. Yes. immediately right. moved in there after catastrophe. And, and uh, it, it's just interesting, the coincidences here. And it certainly seems they would be anything but. So um, a lot of these dots seem to connect, and these programs seem to be being used for many purposes uh, today. Are they war machines, Dane? When you have documents, George, like owning the weather, you've probably heard of that document, a U.S. military document stating the strategic purposes of owning the weather, and you have right. people like Ahmadinejad going in front of the U.N., uh, I believe twice now, and speaking to the fact that he believes his country is being droughted out by these programs, uh, they can only be described as weapons of war. But when those weapons are turned on a, a country's own population, in the case of the drought in the continental U.S., and the drought is becoming very protracted, we post in Geoengineering Watch satellite photo images of the eastern Pacific almost daily, the blanket spraying that's occurring over the eastern Pacific. The data is clear on this, George. When you, when you blanket spray like that in the atmosphere, you, you basically thwart the hydrological cycle, the rain cycle. And so we see this uh, drought expanding, and we see the direct result. When it, It's like the farmer in 1850s blocking the, the stream so the downstream guy starves out and then his land is bought up. 
uh, we see similar circumstances like this happening, and all the objectives we can only speculate on, but we know by seeing the satellite data that they are, in fact, completely disturbing the hydrological cycle with what they're doing. This is scary stuff, Dane, isn't it? Uh, it is to me. It's, you know, again, I, I feel there's no greater or more immediate threat, or I would not have put a decade of my life on hold for this issue. Does it appear that all administrations are supporting geoengineering? It does. It does. Now, we've seen big ramp-ups at certain points. Um, 1998 was a very warm year, and we saw a huge ramp-up of geoengineering after that point. We saw another one in, in 2005, 2006, and then uh, 2008, 2009. It's, there's various points where there appeared to be additional ramp-ups, but we're getting reports now, even in recent weeks, from all over the globe that uh, most places are seeing uh, considerably intensified spraying. And we are also seeing uh, weather events, for example, the, the parade of named snowstorms that the Weather Channel now is creating their theater from. And, and that's another subject, George, called artificial ice nucleation, i.e. artificially induced snowstorms. We can talk about that if you wish. Artificially induced snowstorms. Now, what would the purpose be for that? Well, um, this is something that there can be a number of reasons for as well. One can be to create the semblance of winter. Two, to increase the Earth's albedo, the Earth's reflectivity. As ice is lost around the globe, the Earth's albedo is diminished, the reflectivity, so more of the sun's thermal energy is absorbed. We know these programs shred ozone. Uh, but, and again, I, I don't want anybody to believe a word I'm saying. I, I hope people look up every single thing I mention in this broadcast. And the, the Chinese openly announced they were doing this. People can look this up. Look up Chinese create artificial snowstorm or Chinese, Chinese scientists create artificial snowstorm. They were quite vocal about it until they did a billion dollars worth of damage to Beijing, and then they shut up. Th this is the same as a person's first aid kit, uh, chemical first aid ice pack that sits on their shelf for 20 years uh, at room temperature. You mix the chemicals together, you have ice. And, and people should note that we're seeing snow falling at at uh, 39 degrees, 40, 44, 45. Weather Channel regularly reports this, and they, they spent some pretty interesting episodes trying to explain why this is happening. But quite simply, we, we can see on radar when masses of bands of rain are being nucleated because it just flashes out the snow for no reason. No orographic enhancement, which is mountain ranges that the rain would ride up over and you would expect snow. Nothing. Just, just uh, from nowhere, a band of rain will flash out the snow, and the Weather Channel calls it heavy, wet snow. That's a new term because this snow is like concrete. It's, it's uh, much more moisture-laden because of the artificial nucleation. It crushes trees, drops power lines, it collapses roofs. It's not natural, and, and people are noticing this, George. Now, a great deal of tests have been done. I've done probably four dozen myself, but uh, other people in this area, the Forest Service biologists have done testing, and we see testing now from across the globe. Elements that show up every time, aluminum, barium, strontium, every time they're tested for. Um, I'm, I've been contacted by researchers from Norway and Germany that are testing there as well, and in their last, I believe, 60 rain tests, they are now seeing fluoride, abundant amounts of fluoride, and they have eliminated any possible industrial source. So it appears that fluoride now may be in the mix. Now, there could be a number of reasons for this. You know, the obvious one, perhaps, if we won't drink it in the water, they'll, they'll rain it down on us. And they've they found fluoride in the last 60 tests. They've eliminated any industrial source. Can't account for uh, even a fraction of it, uh, based on their study so far. Is that one potential use of that? If fluoride nanoparticles are exposed to certain frequencies, they believe they coagulate, which would come together. So in theory, if you had a when when you fill the atmosphere with these aerosols, you diminish and disperse rainfall. As the rain comes across the Pacific Northwest, I mean, we, we are sprayed here extremely heavily. This is the storm track. And uh, in the last, in my particular location, in the last uh, seven years, we're almost 200 inches of rain short in my particular location. So this rain is migrated over us in the form of a, a very expansive, industrial, toxic-looking cloud. And if it was seeded with the right particulates, in this case, perhaps fluoride, and it's exposed to the right frequencies from uh, an ionosphere heater like HARP, and they coagulate, then they could cause precipitation to begin to fall again wherever they chose. So the fact that they're doing it and the fact that we're, we're all 
being uh, exposed to a grand experiment without our choice or consent and, and uh, ingesting or inhaling this metal that's slowly but surely clogging up our organisms, that part is beyond debate. But uh, the other uh, aspects of this, these programs uh, are probably many, and we probably only know a few. What about the environment itself? What are we doing to it by doing this? Well, you know, if, if we go back to uh, in 2010, I attended an uh, international geoengineering conference, and the world's most recognized geoengineer, David Keith, was there. And he was caught on film, and this was in Michael Murphy's first film, What in the World Did They Spring? After a three-and-a-half-hour symposium as a proponent of geoengineering and, and uh, pushing the proposal of dumping 20 million tons of nanoparticulates into the atmosphere annually, at the end of this three-and-a-half-hour symposium, they allowed three questions of many journalists. I got one in, and my question was, has any study been done? Human respiratory, environmental toxicity, anything. And after trying to dodge the question, his answer finally was patently no. Could, and, he, and I quote, he said, could terrible things happen tomorrow? We don't know. What kind of a statement is that from a scientist? So as far as what's happening to the environment, it couldn't be worse. Uh, when you saturate the environment with this bioavailable mix of metals, many of the, of the destructive factors we know, many we, we can't yet know, and we are seeing a, a really sharp decline in the, in the boreal forests. Those are the northern latitude forests. That's the terrestrial lungs of the planet. Uh, decreased oxygen output from these trees because they're dying. When the trees sense bioavailable aluminum, for example, m many of them virtually shut down. So uh, the elephant in the room goes hidden. You have Forest Service and other people saying, well, it's the beetles killing the trees. But the beetles are only a symptom of a tree that's extremely weak from drought, from altered photosynthesis because the particulates uh, change the light wavelength form and block much of the sun and from virtually being poisoned from this toxin in the rain. So, uh, again, aquatic insect life decline, amphibian decline, uh, the, the forest, George, and I, I, I've grown up, uh, spent many years in the forest, and it's so silent now. Uh, you, bear, you rarely hear a bird. You, uh, it's eerily silent. And in the last 10 years, it's, it's absolutely scary. And on that note, by the way, uh, latest figures uh, state that the species extinction rate today is approaching 200 a day. That's 10,000 times natural background extinction. I mean, uh, shouldn't there be red flags going up? That's frightening. And if it's happening to, to animals and insects, it could be happening to us. Uh, it is. Uh, and you have uh, respiratory sinusitis, chronic sinusitis is, is virtually epidemic around the globe now. And uh, with the quantity of these materials that people should consider, when you look up and you see a sky that, that doesn't have, that's not blue and the clouds aren't white, it's just this dirty, wispy-looking mix uh, those are aerosol clouds, and there's no set example of this. Uh, just because you don't see trails from horizon to horizon doesn't mean you're not breathing aerosols. If, if, the sky, if you live in a location that's, that's not prone to smog like L.A. and the sky is this dirty, hazy mix, uh, those are aerosols. They, they blanket spray over the ocean, for example, on the West Coast, and this stuff blows in. It looks almost like a fire has happened somewhere, and people should take note of this because that's what uh, aerosols look like. Uh, smoke is aerosols, and it has a similar appearance. So... Uh, this stuff's blowing in from everywhere, and, and the effect it's having on the, the environment is absolutely cataclysmic. And you can bend a branch so far, George, and finally it breaks. And, and we are really seeing that breaking point starting to happen in the ecosystems. I mean, things are virtually crashing. Let's talk a little bit about global dimming. You brought it up earlier. Exactly what is that, then? Global dimming, again, refers to the amount of the sun's direct rays that no longer reach the surface of the planet. And, and it, once again, I encourage people to verify what I am saying. This is hard science. The latest figures show some 20%. Now, the vast majority of data corroborates the figures of in the, in the range of 20%. So as you diminish sunlight, you diminish evaporation. Uh, no question, it's the, the uh, light photons that, that break the water molecules loose that help cause evaporation. Now, another thing that's known about geoengineering is it diminishes wind as well. So along with the global dimming, you have reduced wind, which also reduces evaporation. So uh, even though overall the planet is getting warmer, and, and again, I'm not a Gore fan, but that's a fact that I think few dispute at this point, it should be raining more, not less. And the only reason it can be raining less is an atmosphere full of particulates. And it doesn't matter what the particulates, how they got there. Uh, Mount Pinatubo in 1992, a, a relatively uh, small well, I mean, it was a large eruption, but not on a cataclysmic scale. But just that eruption alone made 92 up to that date was 
by 50% the lowest rainfall year ever recorded from those particulates. So geoengineering has the same effect. And people can look this up. They can Google geoengineering diminishes wind and rain, and they'll find plenty of data. So uh, it's, it's altering, again, the photosynthesis, diminishing the sun's direct light. The, the toxins in this rain are, are loading the soils with bioavailable metals that are absolutely wreaking havoc. So, again, from bottom to top, uh, geoengineering is absolutely wreaking havoc in the web of life. Dean, what is this spider web appearance that we see sometimes in the morning? It's kind of glistening, but it just looks like there's spider webs everywhere. On the surface? On the surface, yeah. It's, it's on, it looks like it just has fallen all on the grass or on little bushes. Yeah, we've seen that uh, on occasion. And what is felt from that is, and I, I know a polymer chemist that's chimed in on, on this as well, but one of the patents, one of, a primary patent, George, called stratospheric wells box seeding for reduction of global warming. In that patent, in addition to aluminum oxide and other toxic heavy metals, polymer fibers are called for as part of this mix that in order to help suspend those particles in the air. And we believe that perhaps when this happens, which is only occasionally in, in various locations, but perhaps these mechanisms that combine these elements, jam, clog, or otherwise malfunction, and these polymer fibers are what we're seeing on the ground. We have tested some of that uh, fibrous mix before, and it's it's packed full of aluminum. We know that for sure. Spiders don't weave aluminum webs. And we're also seeing a chemical residue when this nucleated snow melts, and many people have reported this. There's like a, a cobweb below the the melted snow, and, um, you know, that's again, appears to be a, a chemical residue. So all of this leads back to geoengineering, and, and quite simply, um, the effect it's having on everything, from colony collapse disorder in the bees, uh, certainly, uh, it's attributed to various chemicals and a lot of scapegoats there. I'm not saying the chemicals are helping the situation or GMO foods, certainly d uh, crops rather destructive to the bees. But when you live in a location like I do, I'm many, many miles from any such location, and our bees are just as dead. So uh, this is obviously a much bigger issue. Well, there's no question about that. What do you see as the biggest issue, the biggest problem? The biggest problem in relation to geoengineering? Mm-hmm. That's a hard one to nail down because you have the ionosphere heaters uh, in the attempt to steer the jet stream, which they do appear to be doing quite effectively, destructively as well. So you have ionosphere heaters around the globe. And for those that don't know what that is, these massively powerful uh, radio frequency installations that are, according to the data, can heat the ionosphere areas hundreds of square miles to, to 15,000 degrees or more. It causes a chain reaction in the ionosphere. It causes a bulge in the atmosphere by heating it, which creates pressure zones below, and that can steer the jet stream. So, uh, And that's part of geoengineering. These these uh, ionosphere heater facilities around the globe, again, which we believe there's at least 18. So you have atmosphere, uh, or the atmosphere being... Uh, ripped apart, literally, by these programs. Then you have the saturation of particulates, which, again, is shredding ozone, thwarting the hydrological cycle, poisoning everything on the ground. And now, to lead up to your question, the feedback loops that appear to have been triggered in part by these programs, George, uh, which are global game changers. One, no ozone layer, no life on Earth. That's a given. And we're, we're heading that direction. We're seeing the bark burn off of trees in Northern California from top to bottom. Native trees in the southwest side, the bark is literally burned off, and it's increasing in intensity all the time. So you have an ozone destruction that could literally uh, eliminate life on Earth at some point. Now you have methane mass expulsion. You have these geoengineering programs which alter wind patterns, which then in turn alter ocean currents. And now you have warm water feeding into the Arctic. And we, we're seeing, based on methane satellite data imagery, very significant amounts of methane being expelled into the atmosphere from the East Siberian shelf of the Arctic. And this is, this is fairly well documented. If people look up Arctic methane emergency, there's a group called the AMIC group, the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, that's screaming at the top of their lungs. And I agree with them on the data and the, and the crisis in that regard. Uh, the methane alone is a global game-changing event. It appears to be triggered, and uh, we will see a rapidly unfolding situation in a planet that is very different from what we have known.
Is this like a suicidal mission, Dane? Is there somebody out to get us? Looking at human behavior, and I, I've looked at this in depth, I've, I've talked about this a lot in, in various forums. I, I've read a couple in-depth psychoanalysis, those in power, I don't think any of us disagree that those at the top are not sane. And one aspect of the psychoanalysis I've read, George, was the, the common thread between various forms of psychosis of those in power, and I, I'm quoting directly here from this analyzation I've read, a, a complete lack of comprehension as to the consequences of their actions, even to themselves. So we're not dealing with sanity in that regard. Two, a lot of compartmentalization, where people that are involved with these programs have no idea what they're doing. I certainly believe that's the case. I, I don't believe our military brothers and sisters would intentionally do this to us. I don't believe that for a minute. I believe they're being told they're in, involved with some benevolent planet-saving act for the common good. And I plead with them to investigate this issue. So somewhere at the top, you have a few people that aren't saying that might perhaps realize this is going on, but on the other hand, might be being told by scientists that clearly live in bubbles. I, I know enough of them to know that, uh, that uh, are not considering the consequences of their actions. Why else would they detonate 1,800 nuclear weapons around the planet, blowing up tropical islands and filling the atmosphere with particulates? Why would they do Project Starfish in the, in the 50s and 60s that detonated hydrogen bombs in the magnetosphere just to see what would happen? So we're not dealing with sanity, and I, I think at a certain point they didn't intend to trigger these climate feedback loops, and I think now they're desperately trying to shut them off, a very futile effort, because they realize that uh, they have pushed the envelope so far that they've torpedoed their own ship. Uh, I believe companies like Monsanto are simply the, the vultures feeding on the, the carcass. Uh, they're not the players that are directly involved with this, but they're certainly involved with trying to be disaster capitalists from it. So. As we have this geoengineered drought created in the farmlands of America, and we have soils being altered with bioavailable aluminum, what does Monsanto come out with? Aluminum and drought-resistant seeds. Uh, that doesn't seem like a coincidence from where I'm standing. In Australia, there were regions that were droughted out so badly, we believe from geoengineering, that whole areas were sold for pennies on the dollar, towns and everything. Monsanto bought everything, and now the rain's falling again. So, you know, this is nothing new. I mean, money and power instill the same uh, ill motives, always. Uh, in the last uh, about six weeks, I've had three scientists from major universities contact me, and one is definitely a hub of geoengineering. And I'm being told by one of these scientists that the people inside the system, as I alluded to earlier, military people certainly, I, I believe, are being told they're doing something for the common good even though it's anything but. So uh, we're trying to reach them. But this scientist has told me from within a major university that's involved with geoengineering that she believes she's seeing defections, that people are, uh, who were told this, these programs were benevolent now realize uh, because of the data that's being put out that they're anything but, and they're refusing to participate with these programs. And that's what we hope will begin to happen on a much larger scale because there's no sanity at the top. There's no question. Tell me about the Venus Syndrome Day. In Venus syndrome, and this is a, a scientific scenario, this is not a metaphor, all available data indicates we are on track for Venus syndrome right now. Now, we need to get off that track, and that's why geoengineering needs to stop. The planet needs to be taken out of the straitjacket that it's in, which it literally is with geoengineering, and none of its natural systems are functioning right now. So to get off the track for Venus syndrome, which uh, is a scenario in which feedback loops are triggered that begin to feed on themselves. An example of that, a diminished ozone layer, we have more of the sun's thermal energy coming in right now, and, and we, we believe that is largely a result of geoengineering and not so much a result of the CFCs that it's been blamed on. So more thermal energy coming in, Arctic ice cap is melting, and indeed it is melting. And for those that doubt that, they simply have not done their research. This is not the little tiny ice shelf in Antarctica that's growing slightly. This is the implosion of the Arctic ice. This summer, George, at the end of the melt season, the ice cap was melting at a rate of about 130,000 square kilometers a day. So the Earth is losing its reflectivity. So more thermal energy penetrates. Instead of 90% being reflected from the sea ice, 90% is absorbed. That heats the ocean, along with the currents I mentioned before that are, that are being altered and uh, hampered by geoengineering. Now you have thawing methane on the seafloor. These are methane hydrates. Methane expels through the sea into the atmosphere and begins to cover the planet in what amounts to a layer of glass. Methane is 
over a 10-year time horizon, and most scientists don't refer to a 10-year 10 10 year time horizon. They, they refer to a 100-year time horizon where methane is 20 times more potent than CO2. Over a 10-year time horizon, it's 100 times more potent. That's like covering the planet with a layer of glass. So it traps hmm. all the heat below, sun comes in, doesn't get out, starts to feed on itself, gets warmer, more methane releases, more heat. You, you see the cycle. That's Venus syndrome, and it doesn't stop until the Earth finds equilibrium, as Venus has at 900 degrees Fahrenheit. People think this is outlandish, but this is absolute science fact. And uh, Venus actually, for the record, absorbs less of the sun's thermal energy than Earth because it has two and a half times the albedo, the reflectivity of Earth. So Venus is more reflective than Earth, actually absorbs less sun than Earth does, but it's 900 degrees. Nick Begich has been an expert uh, participant for us about HARP. But I want to get your take on the HARP program. Mr. Begich is the, the recognized ex expert, and I, I don't pretend to be on his level with this, but uh, HARP is intricately involved. At, at this point, to tie it in with things I already mentioned, like the methane mass expulsion, and, and again, that, that issue should be investigated by all because it is a global game-changing event. The latest proposal by the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, again, who is, is uh, sounding the alarm as, this, as a global emergency, and I would agree with them in that count, is to use the HARP facilities to what amounts to nuking the atmosphere in a desperate, uh, unknown experiment to uh, degrade this methane. I mean, this is about as desperate as it could get. You know, this is their, it's called Project Lucy, George, and this is a method of triangulating ionosphere signals toward methane clouds as they're releasing, and they are right now. And it, again, we believe it's changing the, the climate and atmosphere by the day. So this is their solution. If, if, if these systems have helped release this to begin with, then their uh, method of dealing with it is just to simply do more of this. And I, I think that's the definition of insanity to... Uh, simply keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. So, again, Project Lucy is a proposal by which, as this methane is released and is beginning to accumulate in the lower atmosphere, to triangulate the heart facilities at these methane clouds to try to degrade them to a degree that would then cause this methane to migrate further into the atmosphere in a more degraded form and start to create noctilucent clouds, which then would begin to reflect some of the sunlight. I mean, one of the other proposals from the AMIG group was to somehow manufacture 1,000-ton sheets of plastic with 200-ton steel rims to try to somehow settle this down on the seafloor and cap this methane. These guys are really, really desperate, and what they have released is uh, as dire as it gets, but what they propose to remedy the situation seems like a leap from the firing pan into the fire. Are these planet killers, Dane? Yes. Uh, the loss of the ozone layer is, absolutely. And again, uh, there's there's no dispute scientifically about what the particulates do in the upper atmosphere. They, they cause ozone depletion, and we're seeing it. And I mean, people can research this again on their own. On the methane event, George, previous events that are quite well documented with paleo data, the PETM event, Paleocene, Eocene Thermal Maximum, was a methane mass expulsion from approximately 55 million years ago. Global mass extinction, uh, depending on the study you look at, uh, as, as much as 70% terrestrial extinction and as much as 90% aquatic extinction. As this methane is migrating from the seafloor to the surface, much of it dissolves into the ocean. And this acidifies the ocean. In fact, the oceans are acidifying, you, you may have heard this, at, at absolutely astounding rates right now. So. Um, it's feeding the ocean acidification, which feeds ocean extinction. When the methane hits the atmosphere, again, it's uh, over a 10-year time horizon. It's 100 times more potent a greenhouse gas than CO2. So that's covering the layer with a, or the, the Earth with a, a layer of glass, in essence. So during the PETM event, George, the one I mentioned that was you know, the nearest example we have, they believe temperatures in the tropics, land temperatures, were as much as 140 degrees ocean temperatures 105. You had a dead zone on planet Earth that was somewhere from about 30 degrees south to 30 degrees north. So again, I don't want to end up there any more than anybody else does. But quite simply, the notion that these guys have that the fix for our disrupted climate is to fly as many jets as possible around the planet spewing as much toxic metal particulate pollution as you can possibly spit out. The notion that that's a cure for 
climate disruption, it's about as insane as it gets, and, and certainly we can see from all available data that that appears to be the largest source of climate disruption, as we would expect it to be. Are these people insane, Dane? Now, let's go back to a topic we touched on earlier, George. The, what we see off the Pacific Northwest Coast, okay, we see blanket spraying almost 24-7. We know this shuts down the hydrological cycle, so no water, uh, diminished water over the Pacific Northwest. And, wow, what do we see now? We see uh, the beginnings of a water grab in the Pacific Northwest to control the water supply. So you shut the spigot off, create an emergency, grab the water rights, and, and gain yet more control. And as we mentioned earlier on the, on the GMO issue, one thing I did not elaborate on is um, the same researchers in uh, Norway and Germany that indicate fluoride is now perhaps in the mix also are seeing what they term as horizontal gene mutation in plant life from the absorption of these nanoparticulates. So based on that data, and, and we believe it to be accurate, uh, there is no organic at this point. Things are being mutated, and we're, we're seeing some very interesting things in the forest, uh, plants that are much smaller than we've historically seen them, and many that don't come up at all. And, again, when you look at the species extinction rate, profound things are clearly happening. So, um, no, there's no sanity in this equation. But, it, again, how many things do we see, George, that uh, are clearly not done by sane people, depleted uranium being used on our own troops and yeah. and so forth. So we have a lot of examples of this. Well, you know what's so, so uh, upsetting too, Dane, is the fact that, it's hard enough, the atmosphere alone, the environmental changes that are occurring, the possibility of asteroid strikes, these are all out there as possibilities. But we seem to be doing this to ourselves, aren't we? It couldn't be more true. And, and again, uh, we have enough troubles without creating the, the largest one on our own. And, and people who would like to argue that these changes in climate we are seeing are just natural cyclical patterns, so that... That just could not be further from the truth. If we only took geoengineering, if we ignored all the other anthropogenic damage that's been done to the planet, human-caused damage, which certainly can't be ignored. But if we do ignore all that and we just take geoengineering alone, that's anthropogenic also. That's, that's a human endeavor that's destroying the planet. And the notion that what's happening with our climate is a natural cycle, uh, because the Earth does have natural cycles, certainly, we know that. Uh, and people die naturally. But if you take a gun, you stick it to someone's head, and you pull the trigger, that person wouldn't have died right then. And that's the same with planet Earth right now. I mean, the mathematical possibility that these changes are occurring right now in perfect lockstep with human activity, and I'm pointing to geoengineering in this case, uh, are, are virtually zero. In the case of the Arctic, which the Arctic ice almost completely imploded this year. Again, this all relates back into the methane issue, back to HARP. The Arctic has not been ice-free for at least 3 million years and probably as much as 13 million years. And it, it's not happening right now out of coincidence. So it's a very vicious cycle. The more these guys spray, the more they feel they have to spray. It seems they're only concerned about keeping business as usual or, or trying to retain this power at any cost to anything or anyone, including all life on planet Earth. And, and so we hope to reach people within the system, George. Off the record, uh, a NOAA scientist, she told me that they are... They are aware of these programs and, quote, alarmed as hell, but afraid to step forward again because of no First Amendment protection. And we were told recently firsthand by a, a mainstream weather man that they are being pulled into rooms and told, you do not touch this subject. Because, George, there's the things that they're doing with the weather right now, there is no question that any meteorologist that would tell the truth knows that this weather is not natural. It doesn't snow at 45 degrees or 50 degrees. Or in Atlanta, about, I don't know, uh, four or six weeks ago, it was 83 one day and it snowed two days later, then it's 72 days after that. I mean, this is, this is anything but natural. So, so much of academia knows, so much of uh, the uh, scientific community knows that if we could just get this dam to break, it would break from many, many different directions, we believe. Once it breaks, would it stop? When I say when it breaks, I'm referring to, again, the, the, information. Uh, the information. Information, correct. And I don't think it would stop, no. And and one other person, too, that stepped forward. In fact, Michael Murphy's done an interview with her. She's a, a very, very courageous woman named Kristen Mahan. She's a 12-year Air Force veteran, industrial hygienist. It's their job to test for toxins like this. And she has uh, stated on the record she's seen the, she's seen the canisters. She's seen some of the operations. And uh, I wish we had more like her, but we do have an interview with her that has not been 
released yet, although she has done a few radio interviews. So yes, a few are stepping forward, but one of these scientists that I mentioned had contacted me in the last six weeks has been pulled into a room twice and told, and I'm, I'm quoting from her directly, that if she continues to talk about geoengineering, there'll be consequences. Then we see other examples. When uh, the birds fell out of the sky, many people might remember uh, all the bird deaths. Yep. And most people don't know that happened in, uh, we believe, 34 places around the globe at the same time. Clearly something profound was going on. And former Bush aide John Wheeler was seen outside the Pentagon threatening to blow the whistle on these programs. He was found at a landfill two days later. So that's what happens to whistleblowers. But so many people know that if they just had enough cover, if there was enough public awareness of these issues, I believe they would come from every corner. I think so, too. And they'd keep coming, too. Yes, they would. Well, this is an interesting paradox, to be sure. I want to talk a little bit about the fluoride that uh, we are finding in our drinking water, but you claim that it's also showing up uh, where, in Europe? Well, the last 60 tests they've had in Europe, again, do show fluoride, and uh, we're in the process of testing here, and that may be uh, one of the artificial ice nucleating particulates. Ice nucleation is a very interesting science. People think ice freezes at 32, and that's it. It's not the case. Depending on the material, again, I ask people to remember the, the chemical nucleation that happens uh, with their first aid ice pack. So um, they, they clearly are ice nucleating snowstorms. Again, the Chinese openly announced it. The fluoride may be a part of that. But, again, given the equation that we have and the data we have from these same researchers, if these fluoride nanoparticles are indeed being dispersed and they are uh, of that size range, they are being absorbed into everything we eat. And uh, there's no getting around that. And, George, these same researchers tested the grass that the livestock eats, and they calculated how much aluminum a cow would consume over the course of a year. And it was over a half a kilo of aluminum. 